webinar. Um, my name is Alexis Tindall. I'm the Manager of Digital Innovation here at the University of Adelaide Library. Um, I am joined here on the panel by um, colleagues who will introduce themselves in time. But first up, um, I'd just like to um, would acknowledge that I live and work on the lands of the Kaurna people. And before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to them as the traditional custodians of his ancestrals and whose ancestral lands I am joining from. Um, I acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship to the Ghana people to country and we respect their past, present and ongoing connection to the land and cultural beliefs. We have people joining us from all over Australia and other parts of the world today. Um, so I extend that respect to relevant communities who are represented in our, um, in our webinar today and especially to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander or other First Nations people who are joining us today. Um, with that, I'd like to pass over to my colleague Rowan Payne um, who will welcome us on behalf of our New Zealand colleagues. Uh, kia ora, hello everyone. Uh, yes, I'm Rowan Payne. I'm a Digital NZ Services Manager at uh, Tapuna Mātauranga o Aotearoa, National Library of New Zealand. Uh, my team runs uh, Atihi o Aotearoa Digital NZ.org. Uh, kia koutou ngā maunga, ngā awa, ngā waka, ngā tūpuna o Aotearoa me te whenua moi moi a e hui hui mai nei tēnā koutou katoa. To you, the mountains, rivers, waka, ancestors of Aotearoa and the land of the dreaming, Australia, that are gathered here. And of course, to everyone further beyond, greetings to you all. Thank you. Thanks. And I'd just like to enjoy, uh, invite our other co-host, Daniel, to introduce himself, um, who's joining us from a little bit further away. Hi, I, I'm Daniel Van Streen. So I'm calling from London, UK. So I work at the British Library um, and I'm also involved in the AI for LAM teaching and learning working group. Um, so that's kind of why I'm here because we're very interested in the work that Jeremy and Fast AI have been doing around teaching. So I'm kind of very excited, um, yeah, to, to join the call today. That's great. Um, we have a record number of people registered for this webinar and I'd invite you to introduce yourself in the chat window. Um, please share where you're joining us from and if you have a special interest in this topic, feel free to mention it. Um, so yes, welcome on behalf of the Australia and Aotearoa New Zealand uh, chapter of uh, AI for Learn, as well as the teaching and learning groups. Putting this together has been a collaborative effort of, of those two parts of AI for Learn. Um, I'll get through a little bit of housekeeping. Um, of today's session will be recorded and posted online after the event. As registrants, you'll be sent a link to that recording. Please feel free to share it to anyone else who might be interested but wasn't able to join us today. Um, we will have a presentation from Jeremy and then plenty of time for discussion and questions. So I encourage you, if you do have a question that comes to mind, please feel free to post it in the chat at any time. Um, we have helpers behind the scenes, Sydney Chef and Ingrid Mason, who will be monitoring that question and making sure that we as hosts don't miss any of them. Um, with that, I might pass over to Daniel, who will introduce our speaker for today and uh, rejoin you at the end for discussion. Okay, uh, so because of the time of day for me, I'm going to read something out because I'm not going to rely on my improv skills. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just wanted to say it's a true pleasure to be introducing Jeremy today. Um, I've personally benefited hugely from the work Jeremy and Fassi have done, so I'm very excited for today's presentation and discussion. Um, for those who don't know Jeremy already, Jeremy Howard is a data scientist, researcher, developer, educator and entrepreneur. And along with Rachel Thomas is a founding researcher at FAST.ai, a research institute dedicated to making deep learning more accessible. Jeremy is an honorary professor at the University of Queensland and was previously distinguished research scientist at the University of San Francisco, where he was the founding chair of the Wicklow Artificial Intelligence in Medical Research Initiative. Um, the FAST AI course, which has recently been updated, has enabled a huge number of people to start using machine learning. One of the goals of the AI for LAM teaching and learning working group is to identify examples of machine learning teaching materials which follow good pedagogical practices. Um, and I think it's fair to say it's clear from the work Jeremy and FAST AI have done that they've thought deeply about how to make machine learning approachable to people from all types of backgrounds. Um, so I'm very uh, excited to hear what Jeremy has to say today um, and again invite you all to contribute questions uh, to the chat. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to Jeremy. Thanks, Daniel.
So um, my area of interest and expertise is in um, deep learning. Uh, deep learning refers to the application of um, uh, multi-layer neural networks with more than one extra layer, uh, more than one hidden layer. Um, using neural networks goes back a long time. And uh, on the screen here is the first one that was built in 1957. Um, it didn't do much. Uh, it certainly would have taken a lot of time to put together. Um, nowadays, we don't need to create connections using all those wires. We can do it all in software. Um, we have access to a lot more data and a lot more horsepower. And today we can do things that the designers of the Mark I Perceptron could only have dreamed on of. And did, they did dream of it. Um, there was a sense back in the 50s that this technology was going to do amazing things. And today it does. Um, for example, this person on Twitter uh, took a model called DALI2 and then copied and pasted the bios from his friends on Twitter into the DALI2 prompt. And the DALI2 model then automatically generated pictures based on the prompt. Um, so for example, uh, one of his um, Twitter friends had the um, bio commitment, sympathetic, psychedelic, philosophical, and DALI2 built this image automatically. Um, these images get generated in somewhere around 10 to 15 seconds to generate four images. Here's another one for Book Bear. Here's another one, rather long bio, but it's definitely caught the sense of it, I think. I think this is my favorite one. Happy Sisyphus has actually drawn a picture of a rock that is uh, apparently enjoying being carried around on this person's back. Um, as you can see, um, this particular neural network is creating things which I think anybody would have to describe as pretty creative and pretty interesting, kind of beautiful, kind of thought provoking. Um, so I actually decided to use this to illustrate the new course that I just released. Um, so if you go to our website, you'll see these pictures illustrating our website. And what I did is I, I typed into DALI to um, pencil sketch of a cute bunny taking a online course. And then this one I did, uh, I think something like cartoon of a bunny learning about neural networks online. Um, and so <clears throat> I don't really have much of a talent for art. Um, and so as you can see, I was able to generate some pictures I was very happy with. Um, it's not just for generating or understanding pictures. Um, it's also uh, deep learning neural networks are also doing amazing things with text, um, uh, including solving, you know, very broad problems written in English. So in this case, here's here's the the question that was uh, asked of this model called the Pathways Language Model. Um, the cafeteria had twenty three apples. If they used twenty to make lunch and bought six more, how many apples do they have? Pretty simple question to answer, but the idea that you can ask questions with plain English, and in fact, the model not only tells you the answer, but explains how it got there. Um, so this particular model can explain all kinds of things. Um, it can explain jokes. So in this case, the input was uh, they wrote a joke, and then they said, what does explain the joke? Um, or in this example, it's putting together you know, interesting, complex um, ideas to try to figure out. So it says Shelley is from Virginia, but is visiting that city with that famous market where they throw the fish going home next Tuesday. Is it likely that Shelley will be near the Pacific Ocean this weekend? And again, here, yeah, so that, that, that just English is typed in as a prompt and the model returned the city with the famous market where they throw the fish is Seattle, Washington. And it goes on to explain why the answer is yes. So deep learning at this point um, is the state-of-the-art approach to 
a very wide variety of things of which I've collected a small subset here. This is actually copied from our book in natural language processing, computer vision, medicine, biology. So this is where it's all the state of the state of the art in all of these generating images, recommendation systems, playing games, robotics, and so forth. And some of these you might have heard about. So for example, when um, a deep learning algorithm um, beat the world's best player at Go, um, that was something that got a lot of attention. Um, so we um, at Fast AI, uh, so my wife Rachel and I started this organization. It's um, it's a self-funded research development and teaching lab, lab. We founded it quite a few years ago, back before deep learning was doing much, um, because we were pretty sure that the technology was going to be making a huge difference to the world pretty soon, and we wanted to make sure everybody could use it. And one of the first things we did was we released this course. Um, I guess that was back in 2017, maybe it was late 2016 um, that we taught it. Um, and since then, we've, we've created a new version of this course every year. And since that time, it's been viewed over 6 million times, uh, although these courses overall, um, and is, um, a lot of people have gotten their starts by, by, by doing this. Um, uh, we also wrote a book, uh, me and my friend Sylvain, um, based on the course, which uh, has also become pretty popular. Uh, and now it's nice because we've kind of got this, you know, video course and a book that go together really nicely. Um, the, the course and the book are unusual in that we don't teach it in the way that one would normally expect to see kind of... Um, advanced technical topics taught, um, but we actually studied um, a lot of uh, research in education about how best to teach these kind of topics. And um, we teach it in a very different way. We teach it more like the way you might learn to play an instrument or that you might learn to play sport, um, which is based on ideas developed by David Perkins at Harvard, where you actually start building things um, from within the first five minutes of the first lesson. And you gradually learn how to build it better and better. So it's kind of like to play tennis. So my daughter recently started playing tennis. She's six. Day one, she had a tennis racket in her hand trying to hit the ball over the net. She didn't spend years and years learning about theory uh, or history. Uh, she started playing tennis. Um, so one of the interesting things we can now do is find out what the result of this has been by asking our students to tell us. And so after each course um, on our forums, we create um, a page saying, share your work here. And we ask people just to tell us what they've built. So this was one of the, let's see, this is version three. So this is 2018. Um, at the point I screenshotted this, there are over a thousand replies. Obviously, I'm not going to show you all of them. Um, but to give you an example, um, it's, it's interesting to see what happens. People um, share things, you know, that are very local to them and particular to their interests. Now, lesson one is about computer vision. So generally these uh, first answers tend to be computer vision problems. Um, so this person talked about how to classify different types of people in Trinidad and Tobago. This person did zucchinis versus cucumbers. Something I wanted to point out about these is, um, the people who were posting these things um, are not PhDs in computer science or math. They have a very wide variety of background uh, backgrounds. Um, so they're they're you know they're they're diving in um, you know with all kinds of different types of expertise. Um, they're using their laptops or freely available resources, and they're using small data sets with you know a hundred or less inputs, generally speaking. Um, so all this is to say that this uh, th this common idea that the only people that can do useful things with deep learning are big companies with vast amounts of data and, and huge teams of PhDs um, definitely isn't true. Um, so nearly all of the examples that the students post tend to have 100% accuracy or close to 100% accuracy 
on a validation set. Um, this person built an interesting model that actually recognizes what um, city pictures are from by looking at satellite images. Um, this person did different types of Panama buses. This is different classifying batik cloth. Um, this one's actually very interesting. It's color coding um, buildings according to their um, um, according to their condition. And this kind of thing is actually turning out to be pretty important for disaster resilience and um, and response and stuff like that. Uh, some people um, actually discovered that the thing that they were working on is something that that academics had worked on before and often discovered that they had built something that's a new state of the art. So this person um, built an environmental sound classification um, and discovered that he had beaten the best he could find in the academic literature. Um, the reason this often happens is because um, deep learning is such a flexible tool um, that you can apply it to a wide variety of things. And very often domain experts haven't previously known how to do that. Um, so when they then, you know, so when somebody comes along who's not a domain expert and, and tries it out, they discover that that they get, yeah, that they can get fantastic results. Um, so Alona Harley um, is working at Human Longevity International. So this actually, she's a domain expert in, in this area. And so she looked at human normal sequencing and discovered that she could get, you know, greatly reduce the false positive rate um, on this uh, problem. Um, uh, one of our students, Gleb Eastman, um, uh, built an interesting system where he, uh, so he was working at Splunk um, and they had a uh, Kind of tele telemetry tracking of this of their users' mouse movements and mouse clicks, and he turned them into pictures, um, and then uh, built a classifier for fraud, and it turned out to work so well that they ended up patenting a new product um, based on his approach. Uh, we've had a lot of students go on to create startups. Um, for example, Envision AI is one which um, helps uh, people uh, who can't see well or can't see at all by um, using their phone to tell them what they're looking at. Um, and, um, you know, also interestingly, we've worked with some of our students to, um, you know, really advance the state of the art in terms of what's possible. Um, uh, in particular, this article is an example of um, our work on something called Dawnbench, which um, we showed how you could train very large for the time um, neural network models dramatically faster than anybody had done before. Um, and again, we worked with with uh, a team of students on this, uh, not, you know, none of whom had backgrounds in this area before. Um, so, you know, all of that is basically to say deep learning is you know, at a point now where it's incredibly effective at understanding a wide range of data types, including natural language text and images and sounds, all of which are things which obviously folks in library science care a lot about. Um, it can be done at scale quite quickly um, without years of education, um, without necessarily needing really large data sets and without necessarily needing um, large data centers. Um, uh, if you're interested in trying to do that yourself, we have a, a free and ad-free course at course.fast.ai. And if you're interested in becoming part of a community of other um, domain experts in a variety of domains who are interested in using this technology um, for their own work, um, you can come to forums.fast.ai, um, share the kind of problems you're working on, the kind of data you have access to, the kind of results you're getting, and um, you'll probably find you've got a lot of enthusiastic uh, folks who are interested in, in working with you. Um, so hopefully that's a useful introduction to this topic, and um, yeah, uh, pass it over to some questions. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. And yeah, if you have questions, please uh, start putting them in the chat. Um, I thought um, I would open with perhaps a slightly uh, left field question, but hopefully it, it kind of makes sense. Um, and it's around um, how, uh, or what your thoughts are around how you might approach an organization learning more about 
uh, using machine learning and integrating it into their organization. Um, because I think one of the challenges that um, you know libraries and related institutions might have is that they have a kind of existing workflow and existing ways of doing things. So kind of fitting machine learning into that world um, doesn't work quite the same way as it might in a kind of fresh startup where things are a little bit uh, kind of uh, cleaner slate to start with. So I wondered if you had any thoughts or experience um, in yeah. that area. Yeah, I mean, a lot of our a lot of our students work at big companies, um, and often they're the first ones to take a dive into deep learning. Um, and um, yeah, it can be can be tricky. Um, the the I think there's the general idea that I recommend and can work is to show a powerful proof of concept. Um, I tend to think that the the easiest way is to show a proof of concept of something that the organization can't do at all right now. So it's not showing how to do something better, but to show you how to do something you it's just never never been considered because it's so obviously out of the question of possibility. You know, I think like um, when you can analyze an entire collection as a thing. <laughs> You know, it's it's a different way of thinking about library science, you know, to thinking about the stuff that you would do manually. Um, and so maybe, and, and you know, so, and then kind of try to create insights from that, which don't necessarily require massive changes to processes. Um, so I actually did something, I, I, I built a company a few years ago, applying deep learning to radiology. And, you know, radiology has a lot of, workflow stuff very deeply in place. Um, and rather than try to start out by changing those workflows, we kind of decided to start out by showing them things that they didn't previously know, like basically analyzing their entire set of radiology reports and the entire set of radiology images to do things like, okay, well, let's have a look at how many things you missed last month. And then what, you know, like, what, and what kinds of things did you miss the most? And what, you know, what kinds of reports were the most likely to be misunderstood and, you know, stuff like that. Um, and those kind of insights were powerful and obviously led to questions like, well, gee, we're missing a lot of lung nodules leading to people dying of lung cancer unnecessarily on our watch when they came in and got a CT scan of their lungs here. How do we stop that happening again? And then you can start ans answering that question with things like, well, you know, we could add a triage, you know, front end on our systems that automatically look for those nodules and warn the radiologist of anything that's been found, um, for instance. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think in general, you kind of, you need a some kind of proof of concept that people are going to get excited about. No, that makes a lot of sense and it resonates quite a lot actually because I think there's a lot of things like you say that either aren't being done or the alternative just isn't feasible with the resources available and I think that's maybe part of this uh, changing narrative that I think sometimes machine learning and deep learning is perceived as something that replaces humans when I think often it enables people to do stuff that would otherwise just sit on the to-do list. Yeah. For I mean, having said time. that, there are also some jobs that humans do that they would rather not, <laughs> you know? So like another thing to do is just take something that's currently kind of boring or more expensive and say like, oh, well, I did it in six minutes, you know? I'll do tomorrow's in six minutes as well if you want me to. <laughs> Let me know if I'm stepping on anybody's toes. <laughs> and you know, I, you know, it's the kind of thing that people are like. Oh God, I hate doing that Friday report. I have to drag through all these things and check for you know mistakes and blah blah blah. And you're doing people a favor. Um, thanks, Jeremy. I've really interesting examples there. I did laugh at the cucumbers versus zucchinis thing because I've made that mistake. <laughs> so the computers. <laughs> Um, the, I imagine that didn't work out very well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I picked, I picked up the error uh, before it went into production. So Good news. Um, but the um, one of the things that you mentioned was the accessibility and the um, 
the perception, and there's a perception in our sector that to do deep learning, you need an extraordinary amount of resources, perhaps particularly high powered computers. Um, the museums, libraries, and archive sector itself considers yourself usually fairly resource limited. And one of the things is that we have a really close relationship with stakeholder communities. When we talk about wanting people to use our data, often that's communities that we have, um, we manage their collections, we look after them, and those people are in even more resource strained environments than we are. So there's an interest in our sector in um, something like the minimal computing movement and that kind of thing. Can you have got any comments about um, sort of that uh, overcoming that perception and that challenge that, you know, you need to have an HPC and you need to have, you know, a massive, massive data set and that kind of thing? Well, there are organisations who really want to maintain that belief um, because they're their organizations that want to sell you their compute and their services and so for example i gave the example uh, of of the um international competition that we won um, where we were competing against exactly those kind of institutions like intel and google um google invested very heavily in that because they had just released a new kind of accelerator called a TPU. And the only way you could use a TPU is by signing up for a subscription at Google Cloud. Um, so we have this constant battle against these organizations who, who are always trying to convince you that you need to use their the stuff that they're selling you. Um, it's difficult, you know, because it's a big PR exercise and we, we don't have the resources to push back against every one of these. Um, so we have to just pick the occasional one that we're going to do that to. But um, the thing is, well, for one thing, you know, we just have lots of empirical examples now. Um, and anybody can go to fast.ai and see, click on any of the share your work here thread. So in the 2022 course, they've actually got it pinned to the top. So, you know, and I don't moderate it in any way. So if you click on it, you can start scrolling through and see what people are doing. Um, and these are people who are just regular, regular folks who just decided to click on the course link and start listening to my videos. Um, you know, the other thing I'd say is the vast majority of the time, um, we don't start from scratch. We, we do something called um, fine tuning, which is where we take a model that was built for something else and we just change it a little bit to do it, make it do the thing we want it to do. Um, because there's a lot of models you can download that are, that are pre-trained to do things that are a bit similar to what you want. So particularly in NLP at the moment, there's a thing called the, the Hugging Face Model Hub, which has many, many thousands of pre-trained models for language. And so you can go there, you can click in the search interface and search for something you want. And you might find, you know, a, a model that's maybe does what you want, but in a different language, or it does what you want in your language, but using a different kind of data, or it uses your kind of data to solve a slightly different problem. So if you download one of those, you can often do, you know, 10 minutes of, of fine tuning with a small sample of data that you've got and turn it into a model that does what, what you want it to do. Great way of getting started. Daniel, I think is very familiar with having based environment. Yeah, and actually that, um, I guess also brings up some other uh, questions I think come up uh, in our, our kind of domain, which is around documentation and um, I guess, um, transparency of uh, describing the models and data sets that we use. So yeah, I, I think I guess like there's not a very clear question here, but it's like how much do you think there is a responsibility for institutions like libraries to say, you know, we produce this set of metadata because a human entered it and then this particular field was generated through a machine learning model. And then what level of granularity do you go into saying like it was this model trained on this data set at this point in time? Because I think there's a, a balance to strike between transparency and something that just becomes quite difficult to, 
to actually understand for for end users. So I wonder if you had any thoughts about about that. Yeah, I mean, um, so the deep learning community has, um, you know, gotten behind a couple of concepts um, called um, data set cards and model cards. Um, they're, they're basically, the idea is plagiarized from the approaches used in the electronics community, where if you buy a transistor or a microcontroller or something, it'll come with a little booklet describing in very specific terms, all of its behaviors and how it responds to heat in different ways and what voltage at maximums and minimums it has and what, what materials it has in it. Um, and so if you, um, so actually Hugging Face also has a data sets library. So if you go to the Hugging Face data sets library and you click on a data set, you'll see this thing called the data set card. And um, they they vary in quality, but the better ones will tell you, you know, how was this data set curated? Where did it come from? What kind of post-processing was done? You know, what analysis of, of bias has been done and what did it show? What are the possible downsides of using this and so forth? Um, model cards are a more recent idea than data set cards, um, but they're similar idea. You know, so what data set was this model trained on and how? And again, you know, what kinds of biases might, might it have encoded? What might be its, you know, pros and cons of, using it in different ways. Um, you know, these things are always difficult because you're likely to be using the data set or model for something that's a bit different to what anybody's done before. And so in the end, it's going to be up to you to understand it. One of the nice things is that um, basically all of the state of, nearly all of the state of the art work in this field is open source um, and, and mainly using open source data sets as well. Um, so if you really need to understand these things carefully, then the, the code and the data is there for you to, for you to do that. Hmm. I think that's a really valuable comment. And I think it speaks to one of the concerns that people have in this area about um, uh, people who are managing the kind of data that our institutions look after have a very um, high, a very experienced and um, sensitive approach to the fitness for use question and the um, suitability, not just the fitness for whatever the application you're trying to put it to is, but whether we can whether we should use those sorts of things. And so um we'd probably like to see more um more options in that or you know more effective use of, of the model cards or those sorts of things. Um, we have had a question coming from the audience it's from Mike Trisner who said do you think that we'll get to a point where large language models and or image models are too large for regular people to fine tune? Yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely a concern. Um, so um, the size of a model refers to the number of, of um, you know, kind of artificial neuron connections that it has. We call them weights or parameters. Um, and um, the larger ones nowadays have a few hundred billion weights. And uh, the, the, we, we have had some that are up in the trillion stage now. Um, and the issue is that um, to, to fine tune a model, we have to load it onto a, a graphics uh, processing unit, a GPU. Um, so these are the things that are originally designed to play computer games, but so happen to be great at um, training and using neural networks. Um, so these GPUs have a certain amount of RAM on them. Um, those really big language models don't fit into the RAM of even the biggest GPUs. And furthermore, the cost of GPUs kind of follows the distribution where they start getting ridiculously more expensive once you start adding more RAM. So the, yeah, so the big companies to train and fine tune these models need to use the largest GPUs and then the largest boxes to put as many of those GPUs in as they can to have enough RAM. Um, so that's definitely a concern and an area of, you know, that is under-researched um, because it's terrifically important as to how we're going to take advantage of these. Um, there is some quite a lot of good news, however. Um, there was a recent Google paper that pointed out that all of these large language models that have been getting the press recently are actually much bigger than they need to be. 
Um, and so actually just today, uh, uh, Amazon released their new Alexa model, which is over 10 times smaller than the, the larger language models that have been popular, um, and yet outperforms them. Um, uh, furthermore, um, we've recently in, in our, um, so we, we built a software library, an open source free software library called FastAI that you can download. Um, and we recently added something to it to make it extremely easy to, rather than using lots of GPUs, is to basically run a few examples through a GPU multiple times, uh, something called gradient accumulation, so that you actually can can work on very big GPUs, sorry, very big models without needing lots of really big GPUs. Um, and then the third thing, which is interesting, is in some ways, the really big and effective models, fine tuning becomes um, less important because what we're now learning is about something that has got the name prompt engineering, which is the idea that if you come up with the right prompt, the right text to, to kind of say the question you want to ask or the image you want to generate or whatever, you can actually kind of give it some information, kind of like if you were talking to a human, you might kind of say, let me give you some examples of questions and responses to give you a sense of what I'm about to ask you. Okay, given that experience, what would you say if I asked you this? You know, um, or so for example, the the examples I gave earlier that um, said um, how how it solved a problem. You know, um, like the problem of the the the, the fish market or whatever. Yeah. Um, there was a key prompt engineering step in there, which is which was to add um, um, tell tell me step by step or something. I can't remember the exact words, but it turns out this is basically these words you can add to a prompt, and it suddenly starts doing things people didn't know. So these these language models are have more capabilities than we really understand, and through this kind of prompt engineering and um, and it's not exactly fine tuning, but but in the prompt giving exa examples of, of kind of model responses um, can actually get them to do a lot of interesting things too. Sort of like how you'd ask a person, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, I had a question, uh, another question from the audience from Sydney, which is that Glenn professionals, um, like Library Archive Museum and other professionals are committed to high degrees of data curation before public release. Can you talk about automated record enhancement and sort of related to that forgery detection. Um, I don't know what automated record enhancement means. Is that a term of art or um, um, I, what, what might that cover? Sydney was the uh, the person who asked that question. Sydney, would you want to turn your camera and microphone on and, tell, and ask the question yourself? Cool. Yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, you know, metadata lives in a, in a, a hugely important space within our community and how we describe objects, um, how it's recorded. And uh, that's a very manual process and one that uh, involves a lot of expertise on the part of domain experts. So just thinking about ways in which, um, you know, image recognition, for example, is one way of automating um, kinds of tagging within these records, these metadata records. But I mean, there's a whole bunch of other opportunities. So to create efficiencies within the, the GLAM sector, just thinking about, you know, what are the affordances of fast AI in that space? Um, and one recent example of uh, a, a forgery detected um, at an institution we know and love, um, how can fast AI help that chronic problem of, oh my God, we've got a forgery, we've let it out into this public space, it's being uh, funded by taxpayers for its acquisition. What do we do now? So just a couple of perhaps unrelated questions, but I think ones that might be of interest to our community. Sure. Yoda. So, so on the first question, um, that sounds very similar to something that um, we've done a lot of in medicine, um, which is in medicine, in, specifically in radiology, um, the, the information about um, the, the radiologist's report is entirely in plain text 
notes that don't have any particular structure. And um, it's extremely helpful for lots of reasons to turn that into metadata about like what things were found and what part of the body were they found in and what's the level of confidence and what are the suggested next steps and so forth. Um, so that broadly speaking is what people would call medical coding. Um, there are people who are medical coders and that's their job. Um, now, a lot of that coding is done kind of for insurance and charging purposes. And so you're probably not going to replace that with AI, um, or at least not fully. Um, but there's also like a lot of coding that you want to do for more like, you know, patient based reasons in terms of helping identify follow up needs that haven't been met or, you know, possible missed findings or so forth. Um, so what we can do in those situations is we can um, create a few examples of kind of model codes where there will be a radiology report and here's the metadata that we want to extract from it. And you do that manually a few times, and then you can use those examples to train a neural network and then ask it to automate the next hundred. And then I would, you know, get a, um, a medical coding expert and or a radiologist to look at those hundred and identify errors and then fix those and then use that to go back into the model to then provide another 200. And you can kind of use this back and forth between human experts and a model to gradually improve it. Um, you also you know, can have the model generate um, a, a, an estimate of, of how confident it is. So you can try to kind of use it as a triage process. So for the stuff that's easy, then you can basically automate all of that and have human experts involved in the smaller subset. Um, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, and you can certainly do the same thing for images. Um, so I, yeah, I do think that there's likely to be opportunities to, I don't know if, don't know if automate is right, the right word, but dramatically improve the productivity of that process by having a, a, a human in the loop and a model in the loop. Um, I, yeah, I don't feel like I have anything intelligent to say about fraud particularly because I don't know what it would look like. But if, you know, if fraud is something where you can show, you find examples of it either based on images or based on text, and then you could train a model to find the patterns that would help to find it in the future. Um, you know, particularly for something like fraud. Presumably, you wouldn't be looking for an automated system, but just a triage system that could maybe flag the ones which you would like to have an expert take a second look at. Cool. Thanks, Jeremy. No worries. We've got a question from Belinda here um, asking about text recognition. Do you want to lead off with that one, Alexis? Yeah. That's, um, so, Belinda Saunders has um, asked in the chat, I'd like to ask about text recognition. Um, Belinda works in a heritage department attached to the public library and has a large collection of old newspapers and photographs from the previous century, which need indexing and cataloging. We've been trying to find an AI, AI tool that would help to do this job, as we simply do not have the time or staff to read, index, and then catalog all the different articles published in those old photos and newspapers in a timely fashion. Um, how do you anticipate that deep learning could help, um, or an AI tool would help do this job for us? Um, well, I mean, um, text recognition is one where it's a pretty well solved problem now, and um, they are there are online solutions there for you. And I saw just a week or two ago, actually, somebody wrote a really nice article comparing the accuracy of them. Um, and I remember the Amazon one, I think, did particularly well. Um, so like that, that would be my approach would be to start with just one of those online services. If the, if the cost is okay for your needs and you try it out and see how it goes. Um, yeah. If it's not good enough, um, then um, there's plenty of open source pre-trained deep learning models for text classification to uh, text recognition out there. And I would be inclined to take one of them and then fine tune it, you know, using some examples of the kind of papers 
I'd be surprised if you needed to do that, though, because, um, you know, old newspapers and stuff are just the kinds of things that these things are normally trained on. So I would expect it to, to work think, okay. Yeah, and I think it's the next step as well that Belinda's interested in, the indexing, the idea that um, not only can you read the text that's there, but also cluster categorise um, work at subjects. Yeah, well, that that bit's pretty straightforward. So you just need a few examples of of of, um, and pre presumably you've got lots, right? Because lots of things have been indexed before. So just grab them, and your um, dependent variable will be the categories you've given those, and your independent variable will be the text of those. Um, and um, you know, fine tune a model that uh, that's been trained to do document summarization or something like that. And um, I'd be very surprised if that didn't work extremely well. Daniel, do you have any questions? Yeah, I guess um, this is kind of going uh, a little bit in a different direction, but I know one of the things that um, you've spoken about before was the kind of eventual goal of potentially removing coding from the equation and making machine learning accessible in, I guess, similar ways to how you interact with other bits of software. Hmm. Um, and I was just curious how much you thought that was still feasible and how far away that is. And I guess also how you would see that working in a, in a kind of responsible way, um, what that would kind of look like. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, unfortunately at the moment, the vast majority of applications of deep learning require coding. And I say unfortunately because the vast majority of people don't know how to code or don't know how to code very well. Um, so, you know, we were in a similar situation with like the internet a few decades ago where most people didn't know how to design a TCP IP network or set up their subnet mask or, you know, <laughs> you know, telnet to a computer or whatever. And what happened wasn't that we made all of those things much easier to do. Um, instead, what we did was we said, well, what do you want to do with those things? It's like, well, I want to like send and receive email or I want to like visit, you know, click on hyperlinks in a web page or whatever. And, and people created application specific methods to do those things and behind the scenes they're still making socket connections to tcp ip addresses and passing packets and creating tcp headers and whatever but you don't know about any of those things so um my expectation is that that's what is going to happen with with ai you know um um so i you know i i, I imagine that there will be people in this community who will say, okay, well, I've built a system that lets you create, you know, folders on your hard disk for each of the categories that you want to index newspaper articles into. And then you chuck all your newspaper articles into those using this standard format. And then you click on this button and then you click on these checkboxes to make some choices. And at the end you get a, index back in this standard format that you can upload to your indexing tool or whatever, you know. Um, and so that's kind of my goal in trying to help domain experts at the moment is the hope that they will build tools for people in their domain. And, you know, I have to do, as I describe it, I have to do all this hand waving because I have no idea what file formats you use or what would be useful <laughs> or what the constraints are or anything. Um, so that's why you need librarians building these tools and giving feedback on these tools and trying out these tools and and so forth not not ai practitioners yeah and i think we are starting or oh, sorry yeah, go on. starting to see some examples of that so there's one tool that comes to mind which is called transcribus um which is for handwritten text recognition um and i think they've done a really good job of enabling someone you know, for a particular person's handwriting or for a particular language or period to kind of annotate a, a subset of that data. And then the, the kind of data gets sent off to a server and the training is done 
for them and then they get back a model with some kind of error rate that they can either improve or use as it is um and i think yeah more approaches like that i think would be really exciting to see particularly if they do um come out of the, the, the and the daniel itself. i see in the chat that you've mentioned you've actually done some genre metadata stuff using fast ai i'd be interested to hear more about that if you don't mind sharing yeah so um, I mean, I think this is an example of one of those projects where this has been a long term goal for this particular collection of digitized books to add metadata for genre. And in this case, what we mean by genre is very crude. Just is it a fiction book or is it a nonfiction book? Because that's already quite useful to know. Uh, and that information didn't exist for most of those books. Um, so yeah, there was a, a project to do some internal crowdsourcing of a subset of that collection. Um, so that generated some initial labels. And then, yeah, the goal was really to see whether we could use machine learning um, approaches to kind of classify the rest. Um, and I, I won't go into all of the details, but basically we did quite similar to the approach um, you mentioned before, where we train an initial model and then try to understand the errors in that model. Um, and I think the other thing that works uh, very well for us was to use um, a library called Snorkel for generating more training data uh, in a kind of automated way. And I think that's quite an exciting area because it's also where domain experts can inject their knowledge. So instead of hand labeling a load of examples, they can say, well, in this particular collection, uh, nonfiction book titles tend to be much longer. Um, so let's write a rule that says if the title's longer than you know this many characters, then it's probably nonfiction. Um, and doing that kind of gave us a lot more training data for for very cheap, um, but also in a way that I think sits better with people who are used to doing intellectually you know, engaging worker might be a little bit annoyed if you say, could you now click yes or no for, uh, you know, all of these examples when they could come up with more intelligent ways of doing it. Um, and yeah, all of that was done on Colab with like zero, um, you know, paid for um, GPU. So a free compute environment. Yeah. Cool. That's great. Um, we are <clears throat> coming to the end of our um, time together. Um, oh, goodness, we've got one, last, one long question has arrived. Um, this might be the last one. Uh, are there good best practices around language or terms describing the outcomes of deep learning for non-experts? The model cards are great for practitioners, but we struggle to communicate to people about the veracity of their deep learning outputs, particularly since when the wrong when wrong, the errors they tend to generate feel so either silly or inhuman compared to the errors we generate, which feel more explainable. Um, I mean, yeah, I, it's... Um, I think this the kind of modern deep learning approaches involving kind of text prompts and plain text answers can be extremely misleading to to kind of humans because those models are much better at creating compelling sounding prose than they are at giving good accurate answers um but the kind of things we're talking about like the stuff of like what daniel was doing of like putting stuff into fiction or non-fiction doesn't sound silly, you know, like you just look at it and you say like, okay, well, and and fast AI actually comes with a tool that that will show you the ones that are the most likely to be misclassified um, uh, or the ones that were the most poorly classified um, to help you figure out. And you can often kind of look at those and be like, oh, I can see why it got this wrong, you know, this kind of feature. And then you might just try and find more examples of that kind of document. Um, um, yeah, I, I would be pretty cautious in general of using text generation models. And I would lean much more towards the kind of models that, that Daniel was using, where you just get out some simple categorical answers, which in our course, we have 
you know, lots of explanations about how to interpret those and analyze them and understand their errors and so forth. Um, I'm just going to ask one final question, um, and it's maybe just a bit more of a know, maybe creative question. Um, it's just interesting that throughout the discussion here, we've apparently gone backwards and forwards between domain experts and um, people who are trying deep learning in environments that they don't particularly have domain expertise in. Um, and I find it interesting because my in my experience of working with the AI for Land community, many of us are looking for the opportunity that deep learning or machine learning tools or AI tools of various kinds will help us with our existing workflows, help us with our existing curation workflows, help us tackle this extraordinary challenge that we have, which is this massive, massive collections and the interest in making them digitally accessible. Um, I worry sometimes that we might miss the transformational opportunity that's in that space. That, you know, perhaps those examples you provided where someone has come to a sector that they don't have a familiarity with and done something that's blown people's minds. Um, is there anything that comes to mind that, I don't know, it's a really big question that you think we might be missing, but, um, you know, if all we want to do is, you know, um, it recognise our images quicker, yeah. we, is there something we're missing there? Based on my experience of other domains, um, and I've been involved in applying this kind of technology to dozens of domains. Um, yeah, domain experts can both be very good at identifying interesting data sources and opportunities and also constraints. But they, yeah, they also do tend to be terrible at like assuming something's not possible to such an extent that it never had occurred to them to ask if it's possible. Um, or even if somebody tells them something might be possible to be so convinced it's not based on their 30 years of previous expertise that it never was before, um, that they're just so um, so skeptical that they could never even consider that maybe things have changed. Um, and so I'm a, also a big believer in making things as, as open as possible. Um, and that, that takes some work. It's not just a case of but it's certainly not a case of saying, like, if you're interested in looking at this data set, please email blah, blah, blah at whatever.edu.au with a detailed plan of what you want to do with that data, because that's, you're not going to get it, right? But it's a case of, like, actually having a website that people can go to and click a button and get the data set, and then click another link to find out something saying, this is what this data set is. These are the fields that are in it. These are the kinds of things people have tended to use this kind of thing in the past for. Here's an example Kaggle notebook of showing how somebody's analyzed this. Um, here is a online community of people that you can talk to. And when um, not many um, kind of expert groups do things like that. But basically every time they do, in my experience, they get blown away to discover that like their whole world's been turned upside down. Um, so that would be my suggestion. I have no idea what you're missing because I don't know, I don't know what you do or how you do it because I'm not an expert. <laughs> um, and I don't know what data you have or you know, what it looks like or how to analyze it. Um, but if you gave our community access to the things I just said, I, you know, I would be willing to bet that they would come up with things that you had never thought of before. Not because they're smarter than you, but just because no. they're, they're, they have no idea what they don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Um, uh, that brings us to the end of our time together. Um, I would like very much to thank you for joining us, Jeremy. It's been a really stimulating discussion. I've noted down quite a few angles that I need to learn more about and um, directions I want to explore. Um, thanks, Daniel, and the Teaching Learning Group for collaborating with our colleagues here in Australia, in the Australasian region, to put this session on. And